Hey guys. This is part 2 of what if Naruto was adopted by the Umbu. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. Chapter 3. Textbook. Three years old? Again. Naruto. Get that out of your mouth. Naruto looked up, all innocent eyes and cute expressions. The effect was somewhat marred, however, by the kanai he was currently chewing the handle of, his hand awkwardly holding the somewhat dull but still sharp enough to cause damage blade. Kakashi was not impressed. Naruto, he growled warningly. Put. That. Down. The blonde considered, and wisely, chose to obey, quickly placing the knife back on the table where he'd found it. Naruto. You know you're not allowed to touch daddy's kanai, Kakashi said sternly. I don't care if you wanted it. I don't care if you could reach it. It's against the rules. Naruto had the grace to look shamefaced. Sorry. Not good enough. Why aren't you allowed to touch them? Kakashi pressed. Naruto bit his lip, tears forming in his eyes. Cause. I see and get, her? He sniffed. And you know want me her? Right, Kakashi agreed. Inwardly, he was wondering how long it would take before Naruto no longer was reduced to tears each time Kakashi showed the slightest bit of displeasure in him, or his conduct. No park today, he said firmly. He felt a bit guilty, really. Playing in the park was the only truly childish thing the kid did, but he couldn't keep picking up his kanai like that. Maybe it was time to start letting him use them rather than the wooden training ones Kakashi had been teaching how to throw and fight with. In that way, he'd certainly get a better appreciation for the deadly items. Another voice riled at the idea. He's just a baby, it argued. Give him another year or so yet. Naruto nodded tearfully. I'm sorry, Daddy, he repeated, much more sincerely. Okay, Kakashi said, holding out his hand. Naruto toddled over and crawled into his lap, curling up against his chest with a sniff. Leaning back and looking up at the ceiling, Kakashi held the boy for a while, simply waiting for him to realize that the adult wasn't mad at him and he'd been forgiven. One and a half years into this crazy assignment, Kakashi was much better at acting his part. Having read a great many books on parenting, he had quickly become familiar with such ideas as time out, clear boundaries, providing safe environments, frequent praise and even recognizing and rewarding good behavior. Kakashi was proud to say he managed to follow the guidelines fairly well, all things considered. He'd been removed from active duty ever since he'd come home and had been given a monthly allowance comprised of pay for both long service leave and some bastardis version of maternity leave. At least, that's what the others Kakashi's age called it. Really, it was ongoing pay for his mission, but no one was to know that. As a result, he'd spent a lot, if not all, of his time with the kid. Unable to think of anything better to do, he'd started taking him training, teaching him the basics of being a ninja. He hoped that this didn't count as pressuring the child or putting unfair expectations on him. All the books agreed that such behavior was extremely detrimental. Naruto shifted in his arms and hugged him, a slightly chubby cheek resting on his collar. Kakashi automatically hugged him back. Lube you, daddy, the small child sniffed. Sorry. It's okay, Naruto, Kakashi repeated. I love you too. Yes, he was used to speaking the words. He had gotten quite good at the affectionate touches that would reassure and comfort the child. That was another thing the books all said. A child had to feel loved and there was no way Kakashi would let his, no, sensei's, son be miserable. Besides, the words were easy enough, if slightly out of place. Shinobi have no emotions, love included, and Kakashi was certainly no exception to the rule. But Naruto didn't need to know that. Come on, Kakashi said, patting the boy's small back briskly, lesson time. I'll tell you what, if you do an extra hour today, I'll let it be your punishment, and you can still go to the park. Yeah! The three-year-old cheered, spinning and wriggling until he made his way back to his own seat and pulling his workbook towards him. Kakashi took time every day to teach him reading, writing and numeracy. In a couple of years he was going to move on to history and chakra theories. As a hataki, 
he'd need all the help he could get if he was to live up to the academy's expectations. Not that Kakashi really minded what the academy teachers and other students thought of him. He was just astute enough to realize that Naruto would. Dragging his chair closer to Naruto's, he leant over the child and, leaning his arm on the wooden table, began to coach him through his learning. Kakashi was settled on a comfortable couch in the dimly lit living room. He had a book of advanced jutsu open in front of him, and his eye flicked over it lazily. It was nearly ten o'clock, and Naruto was accordingly fast asleep in his bedroom, his bedtime being five-thirty. Kakashi was just thinking of joining the kid, in fact. He was tired. Pakin was lying on his stomach, snoring loudly. Today, he'd summoned the pack to keep Naruto company for a while, mostly to try and get the blonde used to the animals. The other seven dogs had decided to leave a couple of hours ago, but Pakin had opted to stay. With a snort, the dog woke up and raised his head jerkily, a floppy ear twitching and his nose quivering. Huh! He grunted in his gravely voice, sounding equal parts sleepy and curious. With a fond expression, Kakashi lowered his book and reached to scratch the pug's ear. Dreaming Pakin? He asked. The dog closed his eyes blissfully, leaning into the caress. M.M., right there, a little to the left. I just thought I smelled Jiraiya-sama. I was dreaming of that time we... He trailed off sleepily, and to Kakashi's very great amusement his hind leg started to kick in response to the hand now scratching his neck. Within two minutes, Pakin had been reduced to a few sleepy, disjointed mumbles like, chasing cats, exploding, we, running, grr. Then, he sat up like he'd been electrocuted and stared intently at the front door. Pakin, what is it? Kakashi asked, instantly on guard. I thought I'd just dreamed it, but I'm sure now, the pug growled I can smell. About then, the front door slammed open and an all-too-familiar voice shouted at the top of his powerful perverted lungs, Hello! Kakashi! I, where are you, brat? I know you live here. Oh, there you are. Kakashi looked up dully as the legendary Sanin, the great Jiraiya, walked into his living room as if he owned it. Jiraiya-sama, please, the Hataki said, giving Pakin one last pat and picking up his book again. The dog snorted in disgust and lay down again. It's late. You'll wake up the kid. What are you doing here? I came to see you, of course, Jiraiya retorted, sitting in one of the comfortable armchairs nearby. Wanted to visit, see how you were going, maybe meet this new addition to the Hataki family I heard tell about. Kakashi carefully didn't react. Jiraiya was the only other person in the world except for the Hokage who knew Naruto's true origins. The Sandame had written to him right away when Naruto was killed, telling him of the death, and Jiraiya had stormed back to Konoha to scream and rage at his old teacher and make a great number of unfair accusations. Sarutobi had waited patiently until the Sanin had screamed himself hoarse before quietly explaining the truth. Ever since then, Jiraiya had been kept up to date on the boy's status, though this was the first time he'd actually come to visit. I had a hard time finding you, actually, Jiraiya was saying conversationally. I had no idea you were planning to move back into your father's house. I wasn't, Kakashi admitted. But I needed the space, and it didn't seem, right, to sell this place and buy another house. Damn brat, appending my whole life. They do that, Jiraiya agreed, grinning. Then he sobered. Is he, is he happy? Kakashi considered the question that was so much heavier than the weight of the words themselves. Eventually, he nodded once. I believe he is. He smiles often, and laughs frequently, he said slowly. Jiraiya looked a little relieved. I brought him this, he said, holding out a stuffed toy frog. His dumb. Minato had one like it, and I thought. He trailed off awkwardly, hoping he hadn't offended the silver-haired man who for more than a year had been father to the boy. At length, Kakashi nodded and took the toy. I will give it to him, he promised shortly. The Sani nodded before his face split in a grin. Hey, don't think I've forgotten you, kid, he added loudly. Kakashi winced. If Naruto woke up, this idiot legend could be the one to settle him again. As your father's friend and your son's godfather, it is my sacred duty to introduce you to certain aspects of life, he declared. 
Kakashi took a moment to wonder when exactly he'd given permission for Jiraiya to become Hataki Naruto's godfather, but shook it off as a lost cause. Something orange and rectangular was shoved into his face. Blinking, Kakashi cautiously took the object, looking at it with a measure of curiosity. Then he lobbed it right back at its owner, hissing like a demon, there is a child in the house. He can't read, Jiraiya protested, snatching the book out of the air. Kakashi raised his chin. Gintu, he said stubbornly and childishly. Jiraiya blinked. Already? He said. I've been teaching him, Kakashi admitted. And I don't want porn in this house. Come on, Kakashi, wheedled Jiraiya. This new series I've got, Aika Aika. It's already a hit. You're 18 now. You should have some fun. Think of it as a belated birthday present. What better way to celebrate being a legal adult in all circles than to do something adult only? There is a child in this house. Kakashi said every word slowly and carefully, enunciating as clearly as possible through gritted teeth. Your godson, by the way. Oh, but if I ever find out he's been exposed to your corrupted teachings of birds and bees in any form, at any age, I will kill you. Got it? Jiraiya sniffed and put the book back into his pocket. Fine, fine, he grumbled. Such a spoil sport. No fun at all. Well, at least take this one. Kakashi frowned suspiciously at the soft yellow book that was offered to him, but he quickly recognized it as Jiraiya's first book Naruto, which he knew was totally smut-free. He took it carefully. I know you already have your own copy from Minato, but I thought Naruto should have a copy. Two, Jiraiya explained. So he can, you know, see who he was named after. Kakashi nodded sharply, hands tightening around the book at the sharp reminder that he didn't name Naruto. Naruto wasn't his, didn't belong to him. This was just an act. Naruto would one day find out the truth and want nothing more to do with him. Why did the thought bother him? Why was his chest aching again? Bloody heartburn. You're probably right, he admitted grudgingly. He sighed and rubbed his temple. Look, not that I'm trying to get rid of you or anything, but I'm really tired, so do you think you could just, you know, leave? Jiraiya grinned at him and opened his mouth to give a typical Jiraiya response, loud, exaggerated and with a dance routine to match, but a small voice stopped him. Daddy? The two adults both turned and looked in the direction of the murmured word. Standing at the bottom of the stairs, one hand rubbing his eye and the other holding Wink's tail as the scruffy dog trailed along the floor after him. Naruto? Kakashi said, sitting up and unsettling Pakin, who yelped and slid to the floor. What are you doing up this late? The blonde hesitated for a moment before his face crumpled and he rushed forwards, meeting Kakashi in the middle of the living room as the older Hataki stood and walked towards him. Habie Dweem, he whimpered, holding up his arms. Kakashi didn't hesitate before swinging him up into his arms. A bad dream? Kakashi repeated, walking back to the couch and sitting back down on it. Pakin jumped up and curled up on the cushion next to them. What did you dream about? He held the trembling boy close as Naruto burst into tears and began to give him a broken description about being chased by big green monsters with huge fangs and red eyes. And Kala and Muven was Scar, he wailed. Kakashi rubbed his back soothingly, seeming not to notice the snot and tears gradually wetting his chest, soaking through his shirt. Sure, sure. You just stay right here with me. I won't let any monsters get you ever. Peep me? Naruto asked, lungs heaving with the after affects of his tears. I promise, Kakashi said seriously. Any monster that comes after you, I'll kill before he can touch you. And Pakin can bite their monster ankles. Packin growled on cue, bristling at an invisible monster. Right. No one hurts Kakashi's pup. Gur. Naruto giggled, sounding much happier, and Kakashi ruffled his hair, holding him close to his chest and letting the sleepy three-year-old fall back into sleep, comforted by his father's warm presence. Jiraiya took in the peaceful picture the two made, well aware and somewhat amused by the thought that he'd been totally forgotten. Soon, Naruto was happily sucking his thumb, snuggled against his father, 
Pakan had placed his head next to the boy in Kakashi's lap, and Kakashi had one hand on the small dog's head and the other arm hugging the blonde child. Jiraiya cleared his throat and smirked as Kakashi's eye snapped to him, surprised. You still here? He grumbled after a pause. I'm going to put Naruto back to bed, okay? No. Don went to bed. Kakashi sighed. He'd been sure Naruto was asleep, and he'd said the dreaded B word. Crap. Naruto, he began, but it was no use. The blonde had sat up, stubbornly forcing his eyes open and dragging Oink up to hug. Who dat? He asked curiously, pointing a damning finger at Jiraiya. After a pause, Kakashi muffled a groan and bowed to the inevitable. This is Jiraiya, he said. He's your godfather, which means that he can help you if you ever need anything, and if anything ever happens to daddy, or if daddy is tied up in something and can't come home, he'll look after you. Silently, Kakashi vowed that he would never be that desperate. That's right, brat, Jiraiya said instantly. You can call me Gigi, huh? I'm your great and wonderful Jiraiya. Naruto shrunk back into his father as the other man struck a pose. Why did his daddy like so many weirdos? K, he said at length. Kakashi pulled him back against his broad chest again, putting his arms around him. Gigi was just leaving, he said, flawlessly making the adjustment, possibly easier than he usually would have. But after all, he had called Jiraiya Gigi right up until his father died. He just wanted to leave a couple of presents. Here, he brought you a new toy, see? He offered the child the stuffed toy frog Jiraiya had brought him. Naruto's blue eyes lit up. Froggy. He cheered, reaching for it. Ring froggy. Kakashi sighed. Orange and a frog. Of course Naruto would love it. He carefully avoided Jiraiya's eyes and lifted the yellow book the Sanin had also brought. He also gave you this, he said quietly. It's a book about a ninja named Naruto. Naruto frowned. Minam? Yes, your name, Jiraiya agreed before Kakashi could say anything. In fact, you were named after the ninja in this book. Written by me, the great Jiraiya, Toad Sage, legendary Toad Sanin of. Daddy? Here, Naruto proved that he wasn't paying the slightest bit of attention and appealed to his father. Read? Please? For I see pie? Kakashi sighed yet again but consented to lie back and let Naruto curl up on his chest. All right, but only a little bit, and then you have to go back to bed, he cautioned. Naruto nodded sleepily, and with an amused glance in a miffed Jiraiya's direction, Kakashi opened the book and began to read. The land of fire was in chaos. War had spread to every corner, and the once great nation was struggling to find its feet even as disaster ravaged it like a raging fire. Growing in the midst of this mayhem, Safe for now in his hidden village, was a boy named Naruto. Kakashi awoke with a jolt. It was about 4 a.m., his internal alarm clock was blaring, waking him in time for, what did he need to do today? Oh. The Hitaki groaned and debated rolling over and falling back to sleep, but a warm weight on his chest made him freeze. Looking down, he saw Naruto and Pak entangled together, fast asleep. A glance around reminded him that he was in the living room, lying on the couch. His hand, dangling off the edge of the couch towards the floor, was resting on the cover of the book Naruto, which was open. Jiraiya was snoring in the armchair nearby. Sighing, Kakashi tapped Pakan until he woke up and said very quietly, Hey, you can go. I won't need you today. Thanks for hanging around. Pakan yawned widely, showing his fangs, and nodded sleepily. See ya, Kashi, he slurred, disappearing with a pop. Stifling a yawn of his own, Kakashi looped his arms around Naruto and lifted him, cradling the soft body close as he sat up before gently laying him back on the couch and draping the blanket that was hung over the lamp. How'd that get there? Over his son to keep him warm. Within fifteen minutes he'd toilet, shaved, dressed and returned to the living room ready for the day. Walking quietly past the sleeping parties in the room, he made his way to the kitchen. Once there, he quickly stacked three pre-made bento boxes, and dug in the fridge for some food for himself. He ate quickly over the sink, ignoring the taste of the three-day-old cold noodles, and tossed the empty container into the sink once he was done. 
Next, he pulled together a few sandwiches for Naruto's own breakfast and wrapped them in brown paper, stowing them in a pocket in his jounin vest. He was still in shock, really. He couldn't believe the Hokage was making him do this. His mind absently wandered back three days. It was with some measure of trepidation that Kakashi answered the summons to the Hokage's office. Ah, Kakashi. Saratobi smiled at him as he walked in. Come in, come in. How have you been? Kakashi took a few steps further into the room. I left Naruto at the park with some to watch over him, sir, he said pointedly. Thankfully, Saratobi got the message. To business, then, he said. I would like for you to take a genin team this year. Kakashi was sure he'd misheard. That's funny, he said. Really? I'm not joking. I have assigned you squad 11. They graduate the day after tomorrow. The Hokage's face was serious. Kakashi took a step backwards. But what do I do with Naruto? He asked, feeling lost. Sarutobi raised an eyebrow. I'm sure you'll figure out something, he remarked. But sir, I'm not the teaching type. Kakashi protested. Not a negotiation, Saratobi said pleasantly. Be at the academy, day after tomorrow, to meet your team. Don't be late, now. Funny, Kakashi muttered, ignoring the sting as the words reminded him of a certain always late Uchiha. So what if Kakashi had been a little late to some things recently? It was hard to keep to schedule when you have a toddler in the house. What the hell was he in for? Three days later, Kakashi repeated the mental query to himself. What the hell was he in for? He met the brats yesterday, and compared to them, Naruto in a tantrum was a downright angel. He'd actually had to grab the girl before she was shoved off the edge of the roof by the two boys wrestling. Quickly stuffing a few things into his backpack, he filled Naruto's sippy cup with cold orange juice and moved out to the living room once again. Unceremoniously, he kicked Jiraiya hard in the shins and the older man jerked awake with a strangled shout. What the hell, brat? He hissed, squinting at Kakashi. Kakashi smiled innocently. I have an early appointment. You have to leave, he informed the Sanin. Jiraiya's eyes lit up. I could watch Naruto for a bit, if you're busy, he offered hopefully. Not a chance, Kakashi said flatly. Out. By the time he'd kicked a stumbling and swearing Jiraiya out of his house, it was 5 am. Kakashi took a deep breath, knowing that he was supposed to be meeting his genin right now. Ah, well. Naruto, he said gently, kneeling next to the couch and rubbing the boy's back. Time to get up, pup. Let's go. You and I are going to test a trio of imbeciles. Naruto moaned a little and tried to curl tighter into a ball. Kakashi chuckled and carefully lifted him. Come on. Let's get you dressed. Half an hour later, Naruto was dressed and sleeping on Kakashi's shoulder while he stalked towards a group of tired, impatient children. Your late sensei accused one of the guys. What was his name? Eh? Kakashi really didn't care. From now on, he could be winner. Sorry about that, Kakashi said, his tone suggesting the opposite. I got a little held up. Someone didn't want to wake up. He felt Naruto slipping and hoisted him higher on his hip. The other guy spoke up. Hey, what's that? Okay. He could be moron. This is a child. You may have seen one before. Kanoha has quite an infestation of them. Kakashi's tone was light but dripped with dark sarcasm that screamed the warning, you're going down. The kids didn't seem to get it. Okay, but why is it here? The girl asked haughtily. Now, what to call her? Impudent brat who was questioning her superiors. Nah, that was too long. Just brat would do. First of all, he growled with some bite and enough killer intent to make the trio cringe. If any of you ever calls my son in it again, I'll feed your innards to my dogs and laugh as you scream. I don't care if you're bloody gen and wannabes. No one screws with my family. There. That seemed to get his point across quite nicely. The children were shivering in their sandals. Winner looked slightly green while Brat looked on the verge of saying something dumb. Sure enough, she soon opened her mouth. My brother will she began hotly, and Kakashi rolled his eyes. I outrank him, he interrupted. She looked affronted. How do you know? 
she demanded. Kakashi raised an eyebrow. Does your brother happen to be the Hokage? He asked. She shook her head. Then I outrank him. There was a pause while Kakashi let this sink in, before he let the K.I. disappear suddenly and made an effort to appear more human. Okay, now that that's cleared up, he began, let's do this. You see these bells? He held up the twin silver objects and began rapidly explaining the basics of a typical bell test, such as he himself had been tested with. But, um, what about the kid? Moron asked when Kakashi gave the order to begin. Kakashi raised a silver eyebrow. Oh, don't worry about Naruto, he said lightly. It won't make any difference. Just pretend he's not here. Naruto, having heard his name, began to shift, rubbing his eyes sleepily. Daddy? He mumbled. MCP. Go home now? Soon, Neru, soon, Kakashi assured him. I know it's early. You just go back to sleep and let Daddy deal with the extras. Are you kids going to attack, or are you planning on just standing there staring like codfish? Not unexpectedly, it was Moron who attacked first, with a head-on charge typical of the race of the Moron, and Kakashi rolled his eyes before dodging it with grace, Naruto barely noticing the movement as he buried his face in his father's shoulder and nodded off again. Winner was the next to attack, lobbing a series of sharp objects at the Jonin. Again, Kakashi simply sidestepped, right into Brat who was waiting with a glinting silver sword. The adult was pleased to see her holding it reasonably well, but when she attacked him, it was with an obvious, clumsy stroke that he could easily block with a kanai he grabbed from his pouch. Unfortunately, the movement required to pull out the weapon jostled Naruto into wakefulness rather abruptly. In an instant, the blonde screwed his face up and began to cry, signaling his displeasure in a typical tired toddler fashion. Oh, Naruto! Kakashi said, shoving Brad away with enough force to send her flying backwards. Did I wake you up? I'm sorry, pup. Do you want some juice? Juice? Naruto repeated hopefully, looking up from his tears. Kakashi handed him his brightly colored sippy cup, and Naruto took it eagerly. Kakashi lowered him to sit cross-legged on the grassy ground and patted his back, saying, You just stay put while I scatter some pansies, okay? The little gold head bobbed agreeably, totally fixated on his orange juice. Kakashi stepped easily over his head, pulling out another kanai almost lazily and smirking as the two boys took an apprehensive step backwards. He allowed the smirk to spread throughout his entire body, showing it to the kids, and waited a moment to give Naruto a chance to wake up, in case he wanted to watch. Then he moved. Ten seconds, four strikes and a mud bath later. All three would be Jen and were running for their lives. Returning to his son, Kakashi observed Naruto's laughter and mused that the kid would go far in this business. Hey, kid, he said, hunkering down next to the short blonde child. Hungry? I have sandwiches. As Naruto somehow shoved an entire, whole sandwich into his mouth at once, Kakashi absently listened for the Jenin while trying to stop his son from giving himself indigestion. Hmm. Moron's there, Brad is, under that bush, and Winner is, H.M., up that tree. Mental note, his stealth is better than the others. They all seemed to be opting for observation for the time being, and Kakashi decided that they weren't an immediate threat. So, moving on. Naruto, today I'm going to teach you about something called tactics, he said. What better place to teach the kid this than here, with a great many examples of what not to do all around him. Naruto looked up, blue eyes squinting because of how much food was in his mouth, making his cheeks bulge. WRNGG? He managed, giving Kakashi a truly nauseating view of an entire half-chewed sandwich. Naruto, swallow, then talk, he sighed. Don't talk when there is food in your mouth, remember? Because it's rude, it's gross and daddy can't understand you anyway. Naruto nodded and swallowed with difficulty, then tried again, tack tacks? he asked. Kakashi nodded. Tactics, he repeated, but didn't stress it further. A tactic is, well, similar to a plan. It's how you approach something. Naruto cocked his head, confused, and Kakashi reached into his backpack, pulling out Naruto's wooden blocks. He spread them out on the grass before Naruto. Okay, he said, rapidly stacking four of them, one on top of the other to create a small tower. 
Say it was your mission to knock this tower over. What would you do? Naruto cocked his head adorably. Hyatt, he suggested. Kakashi nodded. Yes, hitting it is a good idea. But where would you hit it, remembering you want to make all the blocks fall over? Where would make all the blocks fall? He watched as Naruto considered, turning back to the tower to examine it. Eventually, he came up with his answer and said firmly, Boemon. The bottom one? So your plan, Kakashi stressed, is to hit the bottom block, and so make all of them fall over? Naruto nodded, and he ruffled his hair. Good work. Yes, that's a good plan. That is an example of a tactic, see? For a second the Jounin thought Moron was going to make a move, but the next instant the hint of movement died, and he refocused on Naruto. What if you wanted to knock the tower over, but you couldn't hit the bottom one? There's something blocking the bottom one so you can't touch it? Um. Naruto looked over the tower again, taking a little longer this time. Kakashi hoped the exercise wasn't confusing him, but eventually the little head nodded firmly as the child sat back on his bottom again. Hi then, he said, pointing at the block second from the bottom. Kakashi nodded, half kneeling next to him. Uh Uh-huh, very good. Now what if... He stopped as a twig snapped loudly and someone swore about, oh, ten feet behind him and rolled his eyes. Moron was on the move, and would have continued if not for the way Naruto's eyes snapped to Moron, absolutely livid, and snatched up one of the unused blocks in his right hand. Shut up. I'm trying to ally in. He screamed, throwing the block as hard as his little limb could hurl it. Kakashi blinked when he heard a thump crack and a howl of pain as it hit, followed by a thump as Moron tumbled to the ground. He held himself perfectly still, staring at the now smug expression on Naruto's baby face. I'm not going to turn around, he said slowly and loudly enough for Moron to hear him, because if I do, I'm going to see a wannabe genin who has been downed by a three-year-old. That kid has one hell of an arm on him. Moron grumbled, clothing rustling noisily as he sat up. Ow. Kakashi was mildly surprised. Oh, you're still awake then? Not one of your best throws, Naruto. Naruto scowled, first at the genin, then at his father and finally at the blocks on the grass in front of him. High him with the side stead v de corner. You have to learn to compensate for that, remember? His father reminded him. Naruto's surly look didn't vanish. Stupid bok. Kakashi smiled, not that it could be seen through his mask, and continued, So, Naruto, I have a challenge for you. Say there's a wall around the tower. How do you get to the bottom block to knock it all over? He stood up, dusting off his knees. And on that note, there's a genin or two who have little enough stealth for me to stop ignoring them. Instantly he turned in time to fend off an attack from both Moron and Winner, each coming from different sides. Without preamble, he cracked their heads together, and they dropped like stones. You're going to have to try something different if you want to stand even a snowball's chance in hell of getting these bells, he informed their unconscious bodies. Daddy, I has idea, Naruto said suddenly, and he turned back to the boy. If you climb de vav, why cow no ovr de bo um bak? Or um, you cow just no ovr de vav too, if it's only s big s de tower. Kakashi laughed, and nodded. Yes, that's right, he agreed. Well done! You're getting the hang of this. Hang on, I have a couple of idiots to drop in the river. Saying so, he bent and lifted the weakly struggling boys he'd bashed together and ambled happily over to the nearby river, where he proceeded to toss them into the icy water. I do hope you can swim. Next time, try something new. How's this? Brad asked darkly from Naruto's direction. Kakashi spun around in time to see her fly at his son, Kunai out ready to slash at the toddler, and a second later he was there, grabbing and twisting her wrists, throwing her away, slamming her against a tree trunk and leaning close to speak in her ear. Didn't I already warn you, he said darkly, what happens to people who attack my son? Sitting among his blocks, Naruto grinned. This was going to be interesting. That evening, Kakashi was humming to himself as he cut carrots to cook for dinner. A thump made him pause, and he leaned back a little so he could peer into the living room, where he placed Naruto in a playpen while he made dinner. The playpen was empty, its wooden gate open, 
a wooden makunai abandoned next to the wooden bars. Kakashi sighed. He didn't know why he even bothered. Putting down his knife, he wiped his hands on his pants as he made his way through the house, searching out the young boy. Great ninja skills be damned, Kakashi stumbled a little as he stepped on something that gave under his weight. Looking down, he saw Oink, Naruto's favorite toy. He bent down and picked it up, frowning a little, and placed it carefully out of harm's way on the couch before continuing through the house. When he reached the hallway, a yellow flicker above him caught his attention. Aha! Naruto was on the second floor landing. Kakashi paused in the corner and watched Naruto trot down the upper level hallway towards the stairs. He felt a pang in his heart when he realized Naruto was holding the frog Jiraiya had given him tucked under his arm, where Oink had resided for the last two and a half years. He shoved angrily at the emotion. Of course Naruto would choose toads over dogs. It was in his blood. He was not and never would be Kakashi's son, and Kakashi needed to remember that. He couldn't allow himself to forget that fact. Jiraiya had more right to him as the kid's godfather than Kakashi would ever have. So why did his chest hurt? It was startlingly painful to watch Naruto stop at the top of the stairs and lift that orange frog plushie high above his head while Oink had been abandoned carelessly on the floor. But then a feral grin split the boy's face and he threw the toy as hard as he could. Throwing so that it flew all the way down the stairs and hit the one-third from the bottom with a pitiful squeak. Naruto laughed, and Kakashi watched, stunned, as he, carefully, holding onto the rail and moving slowly just like Kakashi had taught him, descended the staircase and grabbed the frog harshly, dragging it back up to the top stair to repeat the whole process. This time he managed to hit the bottom stair, and he laughed delightedly. Kakashi decided to step in and moved into the child's field of view, bending to pick up the toy as Naruto struggled to climb down the stairs as fast as slow and careful would allow. I see you're enjoying Gigi's gift, he commented, offering the toy back to the child. Naruto took it and nodded, grinning. Yeah. Make fun, squishy son, he declared. Kakashi smiled a little. So this is how you play with toys, huh? Interesting. I never noticed you doing this with Oink. Kakashi was taken aback at the disgust that was instantly written over the boy's face. Not fro Oink. He my fiend. He half shouted indignantly. No Ike stupid froggy. Kakashi had to bite back a shout of amusement as he thought of how Jiraiya would respond to that statement. He shook his head at the pouting child. So, what did you name it? He asked, gesturing the toy. Naruto shot him a look that said, Are you stupid or something? S.A. Froggy, Daddy, he told him in a no-da kind of way. Froggy's Don has names. You wiry dumb. Kakashi laughed. Chapter 4 Kunai Four years old. A pair walked towards the training grounds holding hands, one tall and silver-haired, the other short and blonde. Kakashi listened attentively as the boy told him in great detail about the outing he'd had with his godfather the day before. Kakashi had finally consented to give him two hours with the brat, as Jiraiya was leaving the village today and wouldn't be back for goodness knew how long. Even two hours seemed to be enough to expose the four-year-old to some questionable, purely Jiraiya pastimes, and it was just as well Naruto was so innocent. And then he did the weird dance then he does and he stood on his hair and fell over. Arojiji's an idiot, Naruto said matter-of-factly. Kakashi started and began to cough at the address. Aro, where did you learn that word? He demanded, thinking it was a good thing Jiraiya was well and truly out of the country by now. Naruto blinked at him. The ladies at the hot springs was yelling it at him. Kakashi closed his eye. He was going to regret asking this, but they called him Arojiji. No, they called him Aro something else but I can remember the something else, so now he's Arojiji. Naruto nodded firmly. Aha, uh -huh, Kakashi said, tugging Naruto out of the way of a jogging genin team. Soon, they'd reached the sunny, grassy training field Kakashi favored when teaching his young companion things. He'd promised Naruto something special today, to reward him for his first day of learning kanji, the more difficult form of writing used in Konoha. It sort of surprised Kakashi how much the young boy seemed to enjoy physical learning, throwing kanai and taijutsu forms and the like. But as he always took pains to make it into a game of sorts, 
he supposed it wasn't too unusual. Neither of them knew how to play normally, after all. Okay, he said bright, stopping in the center of the training grounds today, we're going to do something special. Naruto nodded eagerly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You piomist. Something cool and awesome, right? Right. Whoa, hold on, Kakashi laughed, grabbing the flailing small fists. Today, I'm going to set you throwing kunai at those targets over there. Instantly, Naruto's face fell. But that's boring, he whined. I know how to do that. You promised something new. Kakashi grinned at the small boy. I did, huh? Well, here I was thinking today I'd teach you how to throw live kunai, but if you'd prefer something different. Naruto's eyes were wide. What's live kunai? He asked. Kakashi reached into his kunai pouch and drew out one of his kunai, the sword he used in real fights, and knelt to put himself on Naruto's level. This is a live kunai, he said, showing it to the child. A little more dangerous than the wooden mock-ups you've been taught with, any? The odd look on the four-year-old's face was hysterical as he tentatively reached out a tiny hand to, very, very carefully, touch the flat metal blade. When his hand came into contact with the cool metal, he jumped and jerked the hand backwards, and his eyes snapping up to Kakashi's. The adults smiled reassuringly, knowing Naruto knew him well enough to read the expression through his mask. Now you have to listen to me, Neru, he said firmly. The rule that you're not allowed to touch daddy's kunai is still in place. If I am going to teach you to use live kunai, you have to promise me that you will only ever touch them here, in this training ground, with me here to watch you, until I specifically tell you otherwise. If I find out, and I will, I promise you, that you've been touching these without permission, I will stop teaching you this instantly, and you will have to go back to wooden kunai and shuriken until you are taught this in the academy. Do you understand? Naruto nodded instantly, and Kakashi ruffled his hair with his free hand, satisfied. Okay then, he said, stowing his kunai back in his pouch and pulling out another kunai pouch from one of his many pockets. This is a weapons pouch I assembled for you. Using it, I will teach you how to use and care for the basic shinobi tools. Inside, you have five kunai, five shuriken and a roll of ninja wire. He opened the rather dirty pouch to show him and Naruto's eyes widened even further at the thought that these were his now. Kakashi reached out to grab his wrist before the boy could plunge his hand into the pouch and explore it. Ah, not just yet. Now these are some of my old things, and they are blunted, but you still have to treat them as if they are battle-worthy, okay? I want to teach you good habits first, before giving you the deadly stuff. Also, you can still hurt yourself badly with kanai that are blunted. So promise me you will be careful, and not touch these without permission. I promise, daddy, Naruto said earnestly. Kakashi nodded and stood up, brushing grass off his knees absently. Okay, then let's get this show on the road. First of all, how's about I show you what you can do with these weapons, if you learn to use them correctly? Without waiting for an answer, he placed Naruto's pouch on the ground and casually slipped his hand into his own pouch drawing out several shuriken and a kunai. With a flick of his wrist, he sent the black star shuriken flying in a deadly arch, then caught the kunai firmly in his palm and spun, releasing it with practice timing, allowing it to fly through the air, catching all three shuriken and pinning them to the dead center of a painted target on one of the posts nearby. After a pause that lasted only a second, the paper bomb wrapped around the handle of the kunai activated, and the whole thing blew up. Kakashi smirked. There. Flashy but simple, and something Naruto should be able to master within a year, if he worked hard enough. Well, minus the paper bomb, Kakashi had just thrown that in for effect. There was no way he was letting a four-year-old with a prankster gene anywhere near explosives. Good enough to impress and motivate the four-year-old. Cool. Wow. Kaboom. You are so amazing, daddy. Naruto turned big blue eyes on his father an expression of unadulterated hero worship on his features. Kakashi ruffled his hair again. So, shall we start? He suggested, bending to catch up the starter pouch he'd compiled for the boy. He knelt behind the three-foot-high bundle of sunshine and put his arms around him, fitting a blunt kunai to his small hand and beginning the long process of teaching him how to use it. 
Kakashi strode through the streets of Konoha, his left hand holding firmly to Naruto's right, tugging him along whenever he got distracted, slowing him down when he tried to race on ahead. It had been three months since he'd first begun teaching Naruto how to use live kunai, and he was reasonably pleased with the boy's progress. He still wouldn't dare let him practice unsupervised, but he'd gotten much better with the metal weapons. He'd even become rather adept at cleaning them and rebinding the handles. Kakashi was currently mulling over the pros and cons of teaching him how to sharpen the weapons too. So far, cons were winning. Kakashi! Said Hitaki glanced up and nodded as Inazuka some waved at him, calling him over to her. She was seated on the grass, leaning back against her big dog Koromaru, and she grinned up at him as he approached. Hey, kid, she said. What's up? Not much. We've come to play in the park, Kakashi said dryly, nodding at Naruto, who had pulled his hand free of his father and was cautiously approaching Koromaru. The large animal was watching him with an amused eye. Some nodded. Yeah, my youngest one is playing here, too, she said, nodding at the playground fifteen meters in front of them. And I'm not on duty until tomorrow, so I got time to watch the little monster. Kakashi nodded absently, watching Naruto tentatively place his hand on Koromaru's side, and then very cautiously begin stroking his fur. Koromaru was clearly trying not to laugh. Naruto, the silver-haired jounin said, catching the blonde's attention, you have half an hour here before we need to leave. Why don't you go play? I'll be right here if you need me. The four-year-old nodded enthusiastically, gave the fascinating, huge, dog one last pat and raced off to the playground, leaving Kakashi to sink onto the ground, pull out a romance novel he found in his father's study and begin to read. Naruto loved the park. He loved it. It was so much fun with seesaws and sandpits and rickety bridges and a big slide that went really fast, but by far, Naruto's favorite was the swing. He'd been trying to convince Daddy that they really needed a swing in their own backyard, but so far, Daddy had been unconvinced. All in all, it was little wonder the blonde made a beeline towards the swing set. Naruto! The youngest Hataki stopped and turned around, and broke into a grin when he saw a brown-haired, brown-eyed boy with red triangles on his cheeks and a green smear on his grubby t-shirt. His name was Kiba. He was cool. Naruto grinned and broke into a run, racing to join the boy who'd called him. Hey, Kiba! He cheered. The taller boy grinned down at him. Haven't seen you in a while, he commented. Naruto shook his head and grinned sheepishly. Daddy said I couldn't come for a whole week cause I kinda, um, set the living room on fire. The blonde trailed off, looking shamefaced, but Kiba just laughed. And you only got a week without the park? Man, if I'd done that, my mom tanned my hide so bad. I had early bedtime, too, and an extra hour of maths every day, Naruto moaned. My brain hurts FRM all the sums. Kiba grinned at him again, showing off unnaturally, but... In Naruto's opinion, totally cool, sharp canine teeth. You wanna play with me? He asked generously. Naruto was a little kid, after all, and it was Kiba's task as a grown-up six-year-old to be nice. Naruto looked up at the taller boy hopefully. Will you push me on the swings? He asked, blue eyes pleading with the Inazuka. Kiba rolled his brown eyes, but was distracted almost instantly when he noticed another boy standing off to the side silently watching the playing, squealing children in the park. Shino, he said, hey, come on, he added to Naruto, and quickly trotted over to the boy he noticed, Naruto at his heels. Hey, Shino, he said brightly. The new boy looked at Kiba for a moment, and then nodded his head. Hello, he said quietly, his eyes turning back to look out over the park. Kiba grinned at him, and then at a confused and shy Naruto. This Shino, he announced. His dad and my mom are friends. He's my age. Shino, this is Naruto. He's just little, but he's okay. I'm not little. Naruto instantly protested at a yell. I'm big too. Kiba scoffed. I'm six. You're four. You are little. Naruto scowled. Almost five, he grumbled. The new boy, Shino, quickly broke up the building argument by simply stepping between them and saying, Hello, Naruto, in a soft, calming tone. 
Instantly, the argument was forgotten in the way only children can manage. We're gonna play ninja, Kiba announced. Wanna play Ishino? Naruto didn't remember agreeing to this, but decided to go along with it anyway. Playing ninja was fun. Not as fun as when he played learning to be a ninja with daddy, but still good. After a pause, Shino nodded once. That would be acceptable. Within ten minutes, they were running through the park, desperate to get away from a group of evil enemy missing Nin armed with exploding kunai and fireballs and... Bumblebees! Naruto shouted. The others paused. Why bumblebees? Kiba asked. Naruto crossed his arms and puffed out his cheeks sulkily. Bumblebees is scary, he said stubbornly. Kiba considered. It was a fair point. Bumblebees. He screamed at the top of his lungs, run. Giggling, the three of them ducked under the rickety bridge to hide as a swarm of bumblebees flew overhead. We have to do something quick. Kiba hissed, excitement lighting up his eyes. Or they'll break through the walls and Kanoho be doomed. I can take care of the bees, offered Shino. Kiba nodded. You wait here, Naruto, he instructed. Stood dangerous for someone as little as you. But I'm not little. Naruto protested, dismayed and reluctant to be left behind. I want to help. Kiba considered. No, idiot. You get to be back up. He declared. But that means you gotta wait here until I calls for you, cause you're the hero who comes in last second and surprises the bad guys. Yeah. Satisfied. Naruto nodded and huddled under the bridge as the two older warriors bravely left safety to fight off bees and enemy shinobi. Within two minutes tense waiting, Naruto heard Kiba shout for him, and ran out to help. On the way, though, he stumbled and tripped over, sprawling over the grassy ground and bumping into someone sitting on the edge of the sandpit. There was a stunned pause, before the boy he'd bumped turned around, dropping the handful of sand he'd been sifting and glaring. Watch it! He snapped. Naruto pulled himself to his knees and shook his head, his lip trembling when he saw he'd grazed his wrist. Naruto! Are you okay? Kiba skidded to a stop next to the fallen child and tried to pull him to his feet. You need to be careful, he scolded. You could get hurt. And then mum will be mad at me fair not looking after you right. Shino jogged up and was watching silently. What he needs is to look where he's going the dark-haired boy Naruto had bumped into put in. He crashed right into me, and he hasn't even said sorry. Kiba looked annoyed. Leave him alone, Uchiha. He's just a little kid. He's four. Glancing at Naruto, he added, this Uchiha Sasuke. He's in my class at the academy, and he's a total teacher's pet. Gets every answer right. Naruto looked up at the new boy curiously. Hi, he said shyly. Um, sorry. I tripped, didn't mean to hit you. Sasuke looked mollified at the explanation, and the fact that it was a kid much younger than him, two whole years, who'd bumped him, and nodded back. K. Maybe you shouldn't run as fast, he offered, sounding much more, not friendly exactly, but definitely no longer hostile. Mayaniki says that it's best to move a little slower, and be safe than to rush and be injured. My daddy says if it won't kill ya, go nuts. Naruto quoted clumsily. Sasuke frowned at him, the idea that anyone could think something different to his wonderful Aniki rather hard to grasp. Naruto. Naruto looked up. Daddy? Kakashi had seen the tumble and had come to investigate. Are you all right? Marmes bleeding, Naruto reported, holding out the limb. Kakashi took it and examined the slight graze. Ouch, he commented mentally stating that the kid was fine. Here, I'll wash it off for you. Say goodbye to your friends, Neru, we need to go now. Naruto nodded. Bye, he called to the three older boys gathered around him. See ya, Kiba said back. Bye, Sasuke added. Shino inclined his head, but he was weird, so it didn't bother the blonde as he was lifted and carried to the water fountain nearby, where daddy quickly rinsed off his grays and dried it with a handkerchief fixing a band-aid in place once he was done. Kakashi finished quickly and ruffled Naruto's hair, saying, Daddy needs to do some shopping now, okay? Come on, let's do that quickly, and then we'll go home. 
and maybe I'll even let us stop off to get some ramen for dinner on the way home. The promise in place, he led Naruto towards the marketplace, smiling at the child's cheer. Weaving through the crowded streets, one hand firmly clasped around Naruto's, Kakashi mused that it was times like this he was truly grateful Sarutobi had chosen him to raise the brat. Naruto was like sunshine incarnate, lighting up his otherwise grim world. He never thought having a child would end up being so fun. Realizing exactly what he was thinking, Kakashi gave himself a mental slap, and then a mental kick in the shins for good measure. What am I thinking? He asked himself angrily, this is just temporary. Naruto's not really my son. Don't lose sight of reality, Hataki. Focus. Real parents don't get paid for parenting. He let go of Naruto's hand as if he'd been burnt, and instead muttered to keep up, to the kid, navigating his way through the marketplace and pausing at a vegetable stall. Quickly, he made some selections, glancing occasionally at the boy standing patiently, or not so patiently, beside him to make sure he hadn't wandered off. Naruto curled his little fingers into Daddy's pan leg, anchoring himself to the man in an instinctive bid not to lose him, his eyes flitting around the marketplace curiously. It was really interesting, this whole place. There was something going on in every direction, and Naruto amused himself trying to observe everything at once finally settling on watching a pigeon trying to work up the courage to pick up half a crust of bread from near a busy bread stall. Daddy started to move, a paper bag tucked under his arm, and Naruto allowed himself to be tugged along by his grip on his father's clothing. They stopped again, and Naruto glanced up to see they were at a stall that sold pasta and rice and stuff like that. Bored with the idea, he looked around again and his eyes lit up when he spotted it. An orange balloon, ownerless dancing along teasingly through the crowds, ignored by everyone as the wind blew it to and fro along the ground. Naruto was hooked. Without a thought, he let go of his father and left his side, weaving through the crowds and never once taking his eyes of the bright orange bubble. He'd almost reached it when firm hands clapped around his ribcage and hoisted him up into the air. Daddy must have caught him. Squirming, Naruto turned to pout at his father, but the expression slid right off as instead of his father's reproving features, he was confronted with the face of a total stranger. With a shriek of surprise and fear, Naruto began struggling in earnest, the hundreds of warnings his father had given him about going with strangers echoing in his mind. The stranger shifted so that he could bring his hands together to make hand seals, quickly flashing through a few and saying a couple of words Naruto didn't understand. Suddenly, the four-year-old felt exhausted and his eyes began to fall closed. Just before he drifted off, he sensed a man carrying him stroking his hair, saying, There now, shu. Sure. That was a good deal easier than I expected it to be, little Hitaki. You just be a good boy and sleep now. Then, Naruto was forced to give in to the strange drowsiness, and fell asleep. Da was getting fed up with this stupid mission. He gritted his teeth as he plunged into an icy cold stream washing himself as quickly as physically possible before shooting out again, drying himself and dressing rapidly. Rubbing a towel through his wet hair, he wandered back towards camp, thinking longingly of hot baths and proper beds and mountains instead of these endless trees and home in general. Stupid Kanoha. As he neared camp, he heard Maro and Juro arguing again. He sighed heavily, but didn't pause on his way back to them tuning in on the conversation as he plunked down next to the burned-out fire. I'm telling you, there is no way that will work. Maro snapped. If you think that Hitaki is stupid enough to leave his house unwarded. I can bypass any ward. Juro interrupted. And it's the only time the bastard takes his eyes off the brat, when he's asleep. I still say we need to gather more information. Maro argued. We've been trailing them for two weeks. Juro retorted. If we wait much longer, we'll be found out. Perhaps we could lure him out, Dai mused boredly. He rolled his eyes at the twin scoffs he received. No way. Not going to work. And then they were back to arguing. Dai dropped his head on his hands and mused that this was in no way worth what he was being paid for it. Like a silent ghost, a new figure darted into their camp. Pack it up, boys and girls, it said in a sing-song voice. We're moving out. The other three men looked up in amazement as their team leader Kane stood before them, 
the objective of their mission held tight and sleeping in his arms. You got him! exclaimed Juro. How? frowned Dai. You better not have raised the alarm, Kane, threatened Maro. Kane shifted the child in his arms and waved the concern away. Nah, but I'd advise we move out before his father realizes he's gone, hey? Come on, hustle! The others all winced at the thought and quickly set about demolishing any trace of the camp. Within five minutes, they were on the move, heading back to their village. Kakashi was halfway through buying milk and butter when he glanced down and didn't see Naruto standing obediently beside him. His heart leapt in his chest, and for a moment, Kakashi fell victim to absolute panic, spinning and scanning the area around him frantically for the sight of the small, yellow-haired child. He couldn't see him, and for a moment the panic threatened to overwhelm him, but then his ninja training took over and he forced the feeling back. Calm down. He can have gone far, he reasoned with himself. Without a thought, he set his groceries down right there and striding away though the bustling market, eyes scanning the area rapidly. He stubbornly fought down the sick feeling in his gut, as well as the horrible what-if circling in his mind. When it became apparent he wasn't going to find the kid easily by himself, he bit into his thumb without hesitation and flashed through a series of hand signs before slamming his palm down on the ground firmly. With a flash of chakra and a small cloud of smoke, Packin appeared. Yo, the pug said. What's up? He paused, sniffing the air. You smell worried, Kakashi. What's happened? Where's the little one? That's the problem, Packin, Kakashi said, bristling at the accusation, he's lost. And I do not smell worried. I'm a seasoned shinobi, I don't worry. Whatever you say, boss, Packin snorted. Then what the man had actually said clicked and his head jerked up, mild panic filling his eyes. Wait, did you say missing? Then why are we just standing here? Let's find him. Kakashi nodded and Packin scrambled to his paws, shoving his nose down into the dirt to search for the well-known smell of his master's puppy. Hmm, HM, 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 the pug hummed to himself as he led Kakashi through the marketplace, unconsciously tracing the shopping route Kakashi had taken. Yes, okay. So he was still with you here, and here, and then you turned this corner. He's still with you, and then you stopped at this stall here and aha. Uh-huh. What? Kakashi demanded, then winced at how anxious he sounded. What do you smell? He tried again, managing to sound much more controlled. Packin glanced at him and continued tracking, even as he answered. Your scent stays there, by the stall, but his wanders over this way, by itself. He must have seen something that caught his interest, or something. Kakashi nodded. That was likely. Naruto had just wandered away, and was probably even now searching blindly for his daddy, frightened and tired, but unharmed and in no danger. A small amount of relief spread throughout the Hataki, even as he felt guilty. He hadn't noticed the kid's absence for more than fifteen minutes. Then. Oh. Oh no. Shit. Packin snarled, hackles rising. Kakashi twitched. What? He snapped, not caring this time how anxious he sounded. Packin looked up at him with serious chocolate eyes. Kakashi, he was taken, he said seriously. Kakashi felt his heart freeze. What do you mean? He asked in a low voice. The dog closed his eyes. I mean, someone took him, Kakashi. Someone picked him up and carried him away. Foreign scent. There was a pause as that sunk in. Packin looked up to see the visible skin on Kakashi's face was paper white. No, he whispered, and took off top speed. Naruto blinked groggily, shifting slowly. His head hurt, his throat was dry, and above all he missed Daddy. It took him a moment to figure out why he was feeling so miserable and frightened, before he remembered what had happened before he had fallen asleep. Instantly, he gave a distressed cry and began to move, writhing in his spot in an attempt to sit up. It took him a long moment to realize that someone had draped a rough blanket over him, and he began to cry plaintively. Instantly, a shape moved towards him and touched him gently, and Naruto flinched violently. He cracked his eyes open to see a red-haired man with scars crisscrossing his left cheek. What's wrong with it? The red-haired man was asking, but he wasn't looking at Naruto, no, 
He was looking over the small body at the others gathered there. Naruto spun his head, taking in all of them, black hair, brown hair, green hair, and began to cry harder. Might be scared, offered black hair. I sure as hell would be. Eh, it's probably thirsty. The sleep jutsu does that, green hair said dismissively, unscrewing the cap of a bottle. He grabbed Naruto and forced him to sit up, kneeling behind him and weaving his hand through gold hair, tilting the child's head back and forcibly placing the bottle at his lips. Drink, you brat, he added roughly. Naruto gagged and spluttered, managing to swallow some but not nearly all of the cool, metal-tasting liquid that flooded his mouth. The rest splashed down over his front, soaking his shirt through. His tears leaked faster, and he struggled against the cruel grip on his hair, desperate to be free. Hey, Maro, how's about you don't drown the kid? Brown hair said, tugging green hair away and smiling at Naruto gently. Hey, your name is Naruto, right? I'm Kane. It's okay now. You just be good, and no one will hurt you. I w want dd dad dy, Naruto choked, curling into a defensive ball. The adults exchanged glances and leers. Do you now? Black hair droned. Fat chance, green hair snapped, not after all the trouble we went to to get you away from bloody Hitaki. You're not going to be staying with your daddy anymore, red hair said quietly. Naruto froze. I, I'm not, he asked haltingly. Kane shook his head. No, he said gently. Look, this is Dai, he pointed at red hair, Maro, green hair, and Juro. Black hair. We're ninja from Kyumokagir. We're here to take you home. Don't you see? You were born in Lightning Country. You belong with us. Yeah. We totally have claim to a Hataki, Juro said enthusiastically. No way are we giving that up. No matter what bastard wants his baby home with him, Maro added snidely. Shouldn't be screwed around with a lightning girl in the first place, should he? Little harsh, Maro, Dai commented dryly. Naruto stared around at them all, uncomprehending. But, I don't want to leave daddy, he said, his lips trembling as tears threatened to fall again. I, I love daddy. There was an awkward pause. He'll forget, Kane said confidently. Then, to Naruto, come on, kid. Enough of a break. We need to keep moving. Naruto watched the man reach out to grab him, and just like that, his fear and uncertainty vanished. In its place was a sort of quivery determination that filled his whole body. They wouldn't take him. He wouldn't let them. And then Daddy would come and kick their butts. His blue eyes narrowed and he quickly scrambled to his feet, falling into a taijutsu stance his daddy had taught him. The next second, Kane grabbed for him, and the fight began. Kakashi slammed into the Hokage's office, totally bypassing both the secretary in the foyer and the Chunin guards stationed outside the office door, pack and hot on his heels. Naruto. He's been abducted, he burst out, cutting right across what looked like a briefing for a mission. The Jounin squad all looked rather affronted, and then shocked and sympathetic as they realized why exactly their fellow Jounin had interrupted. Saratobi paused for a moment to gather himself. Kakashi, calm down, he said firmly. What has happened? Naruto has been abducted, taken out of the village, Kakashi repeated agitatedly. Don't know who or why, but they were in the marketplace, and I looked away for a second, and Pakin says they grabbed him right there. Please, Hokage-sama, grant me leave to leave the village. I need to find him. Sarutobi blinked. Wait, he said. He turned to the Jounin team gathered in his office. You can go, you have your orders, he said. The four Jounin nodded and disappeared, leaving Kakashi and Pakin alone with the old man. Kakashi, take a moment to calm yourself. I will gather a Chunin squad to go with you. But Kakashi began to protest the delay, but a look from Saratobi silenced him. Please hurry, he murmured. The half an hour he was forced to wait while a team was assembled and briefed was easily the most torturous, the most painful he had ever experienced, including that time when he was being interrogated in IWA and they'd poured acid over his body. Finally, finally, it was time to leave. Kakashi jerked to his feet and swept his eyes over the three chunin assembled. Pretty good for a last-minute thing, but not the ninja he would have chosen if he could have. 
Karinai, one of the Kunoichi from his age group, all set for the Jounin exam next month, and two people Kakashi knew only by sight and name, Kamazuki Izumo and Hagen Kotetsu, 18, relatively new to being Chunin. Kakashi fidgeted as the Hokage gave them a few last-minute orders and was out the window before Saratobi had even completed the word go. It was a moment before the Chunin realized what had happened, and they exchanged confused looks, but the Sandam just sighed and waved them after him. Catch up if you can, he advised. Then they were off. Naruto sank his teeth into the arm that reached towards him, throwing a punch at the near body of the big man. When he tasted blood, he let go instantly, spitting and gagging, only just computing Kane's cry of pain as he did so. Ah, the feral little Sinova bitch, he shouted, clapping his hand over the perfect ring of teeth marks he now had bleeding on his arm. That's gonna scar, you fucking. Son of a bastard, you mean, Maro corrected, eyes fixed on the panting four-year-old who was standing slightly clumsily in his best fighting stance. Of course Otaki would teach a co-bastard a few fighting moves. Damn it. Well, wasn't Daddy Hitaki already, like, a genin by the age of this runt? Dai asked. We could have a fight on our hands. Ba Juro scoffed. He's still just a kid. Grab him. While they were talking, the four of them had circled around Naruto, forming a four-point ring to him and the wide-eyed child. Naruto spun his head, searching for an escape route, and just barely managed to dodge out of the way when Maro made a lunge at him. Just like with Daddy, the blonde thought to himself grimly, ducking under Kane's arms to deliver a punishing kick to the shins. Somehow, it wasn't even remotely fun, unlike when he played like this with Daddy. Daddy. Naruto choked on a sob as arms enveloped him, and he began to claw at them, squirming, biting, kicking, elbowing and punching to get loose. Somehow, he slipped through the arms and fell to the ground. I wouldn't go with them. I can Dai had a hold on him now, hoisting him into the air by his arms and crushing him against his chest, so all the little teeth could find to bite into was a tough jounin vest. Naruto squirmed desperately, reaching, stretching. I just has to hold on. He felt his hand brush the coarse material, and jerked, managing to slide that crucial inch and a half closer. Daddy will come. He's gonna come get me. He promised. Little fingers curled around a hard cylinder, and Naruto blinked to rid himself of tears before jerking his hand back, inadvertently driving his elbow into Dai's right tricep. Dai didn't even notice, being too preoccupied with a squirming body and flailing legs. Daddy, please hurry. I'm frightened. This last mental plea echoing in his mind, Naruto gritted his teeth and swung his arm, driving his clenched right fist with all his might against Dai's hip the only place his short arms could reach in his current position. It worked. Dai swore loudly and Naruto was once again dropped to the ground, where he dragged himself to his feet and fell back into a wobbly ready stance, stolen kunai held out before him, red blood dripping off it slowly. Fucking brat, he stabbed me. Why and Dai? Kane, that sleep jutsu of yours would be good around about now, Juro prompted, taking a step forwards and jerking back as Naruto slashed at him. The men looked angry now. Naruto was trembling, more frightened than he'd ever been as he tried desperately to stand tall and be brave. Daddy. Packin led the retrieval team through the trees at breakneck speed, the scent of the kidnappers fresh enough for him to follow it easily. Kakashi was right on his tail, almost literally, to the point where he was glad he didn't have a long bushy tail like Ryu or Shiba. If he had, it would have already been trodden on by his frantic master. Kakashi was himself more frightened than he could ever remember being. The day Abito died, the QB attack, every single assassination, it all paled in comparison to this feeling. What would he do if Naruto was gone? Dead or lost to him forever? No. Kakashi shoved that thought away. He wouldn't let that happen. No matter what it took, he would get Naruto back. He wouldn't let anyone steal his son from him like this. The Jounin missed a beat as he realized his thoughts, and a second later his mind settled into a sort of grim understanding. Yes, Naruto was his son. Nothing would ever change that. He'd raised, cared for, fed, nursed, loved, yes, he truly loved him. More than anything. And now, paternal instinct was rearing in him, 
ugly and animalistic. He would tear apart the ones who dared to take his son from him. That was a promise. He just regretted that it took something like this for him to realize it. Cursing himself for not seeing, not understanding, for never telling the boy, his son, just how much he meant to his daddy, Kakashi gritted his teeth and put on another burst of speed, making pack and yelp and begin to pump harder, trying to keep pace. Keep up! The Hataki snarled back at the winded Shunin following him, not caring one jot that they were growing tired. Not far now, pack and panted at him glancing at him long enough for Kakashi to spot the fire in his usually gentle eyes. The pug was as angry as he, well, almost as angry as he was. It was impossible to be as angry as a scared father. But Pakin loved Naruto, too. His pack leader's puppy. Just up ahead, the small animal barked. They're on the ground, not moving. We should be there, right, now. Kakashi forced himself to stop in a tree a hundred meters back when Pakin did and observed the situation. Below them, four tall figures circled the fifth smaller one. Kakashi's eyes, used to spotting such details, quickly spotted and logged their Kumo Hitaite and their defensive stances, before flicking to Naruto and seeing the bloody kanai in his hand. From this angle, he couldn't see the child's face, but he could see that he was shivering. Several of the men were bleeding and Kakashi felt a stab of pride despite everything. That's my boy. The man with brown hair was flicking through hand signs, and suddenly there was a flare of chakra and Naruto gave a distressed cry before crumpling. The man with green hair caught him and lifted him roughly, slinging the limp body over his shoulder carelessly. Kakashi leant forwards and snarled, sounding more like a dog than Pakin did, and launched himself right into the midst of the kidnappers, had tied up, Sharingan glowing an angry red, a deadly, demonic fury written across Kakashi's whole stance. There was just enough time for one of the fucking dead men who dared to touch his son to say in a slow okay what do we do now tone, she it, before, for the first time since Abito had died, Kakashi lost himself to anger. Kotetsu was running, trying to catch up with his crazy squad leader, when suddenly the beautiful woman, Kurinai, wasn't it? That was on their squad caught him around the shoulders and sent them both crashing to a stop on a tree branch. Izumo banged into them from behind. What dash? Kotetsu began, but Kurinai just pointed ahead and below them. One glance, and both teenagers were suddenly highly relieved she had stopped them. The carnage was unbelievable. Within ten minutes the horrible sounds below them stopped, and Kotetsu felt it was safe to uncover his eyes and look again. Kakashi Senpai was kneeling in the middle of the bodies of the men he'd fought, no slaughtered, cradling the limp body of the kid they'd been sent to recover tight to his chest, his face buried in the boy's blonde hair. Karinai was the first one who dared to move. She knew Kakashi, so she felt a measure of reassurance in the thought that he probably would recognize her before he attacked her. She had seen Ninja in this state before, and knew that it would take very little to set him off again. Cautiously, she jumped down from her tree branch, landing lightly before him. Kotetsu and Izumo watched her as if she were crazy. Kakashi? She called, not moving any closer. For a long moment, he didn't respond, but just as Karinai was preparing to back off and give him some time to try and drag his mind back together, his head lifted and he looked directly at her. To her very great relief, he didn't seem angry any longer, rather, frightened and grieving. Then, the moment passed and, like a switch had been flipped, Kakashi the father was put away and Kakashi the shinobi was back. Kurinai, he said, his voice perfectly level as he raised a hand to pull his hatai down over his Sharingan eye. He didn't let go of Naruto for a second. Is. Naruto is he. Kurinai was afraid to ask. Kakashi shook his head, settling back to sit on the blood-splattered ground, heedless of the corpses around him. He's alive, but I can't get him to wake up, he said, a touch of despair worming its way into his voice. I think I recognize those hand seals, Kurinai offered. I'm fairly sure it was a genjutsu. Do you want me to have a look at him? Instantly, Kakashi's arms tightened around the unconscious boy protectively, but after a moment good sense won out and he sighed, nodding once and laying the boy down in his lap, flicking a finger to call Kurinai over. Understandably, 
Karina hesitated, not very anxious to approach the man she'd just seen tear four down and bigger than himself limb from limb, almost literally. Suddenly, she understood why exactly Kakashi had graduated and been promoted so early. He was brilliant and terrifying. Reminding herself firmly that it was still Kakashi, and that he hadn't changed, just her perception of him, Karina moved closer, kneeling before the man. She could sense that he was as tense as a coiled spring as she carefully reached out a hand to examine Naruto, and made sure all her movements were slow and non-threatening. After a moment, she was sure. It's just a mild sleep jutsu, she reported. He's fine, not in any pain. I can remove it, but it's safest just to let it wear off naturally. It should only take a couple of hours or so, and he'll wake up feeling like he's just had a nap. Is that okay? After a pause, Kakashi nodded. Hooking his arms around Naruto and hugging him close again, he stood, saying, Let's get him home, then. The two boys can gather what's left of them. He jerked his head at the bodies, and up in the tree, Izumo and Kotetsu both winced. Naruto came back to the world groggily, unwillingly. Eventually, he was awake enough to recognize the warmth around him, the iron arms hooked under his shoulders and knees, holding him close to a strong chest, the sensation of movement as the person carrying him leapt between trees. The last thing he remembered was Kane doing that some jutsu thing on him, and him feeling really sleepy, and Naruto let out a choked sob as he realized he must be being carried by one of those horrible men that were taking him away. He began to struggle weakly, tears stinging eyes he had yet to open. The arms hugged him tighter for a moment, and a jolt ran through Naruto as the man spoke. There now. Don't worry, Nero, I've got you. He knew that voice. That was. Naruto's eyes flew open and he looked up at his daddy's masked face, his mouth opening slightly in surprise as relief flooded through him so sharp it hurt. Daddy, he croaked. Kakashi glanced down at him and responded by holding him even tighter. I'm here, son. You found me, Naruto mumbled tearfully. You came. I knew you'd come. Daddy. Kakashi shifted Naruto so that he was held up against his chest, and Naruto put his hands around Daddy's neck and breathed in the comforting smell that was his father, beginning to sob openly. Kakashi just rubbed his back, murmuring in his ear softly even as he continued the journey back to Konoha without breaking stride. Sure, it's okay, don't worry. I would never let them take you away. I'm sorry I didn't get there sooner, Naruto. I love you. Everything is going to be okay. You're safe now. I love you. I love you. My son. That's it for part two. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.